And now for our Creative Spirit Award. If I can please ask C.K. Williams to come to the podium, and if I could also ask Greg Janikian, who is the director of the Creative Writing Center at the Kelly Writers House, who will present the award, to also join him. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, and actually thank you to all you honorees. You're, you're a very impressive bunch. Uh, it's an honor and privilege for me to be introducing a fellow alumnus today, C.K. Williams, graduate of the college, 1959. I first met him in 1970 when I was an undergraduate here at Penn and a student in Professor Daniel Hoffman's poetry workshop. Mr. Williams, and we called him Mr. Williams, came to our class as a visiting poet bearing with him his newly published first book of poems, Lies, from which he read to us. We were all impressed, intimidated, filled with wonder and a new sense of purpose at what poetry might do. I remember especially his poem, Hood, about a high school rebel who wore engineer's boots and his hair long, drove too fast and finally broke both his lungs on the steering wheel, whose dangerous life was both terror and attraction to everyone else. I remember thinking that in some way the poem might have been talking about what poets do and are, how they engage in the outlaw, risky venture of bearing difficult truths into our lives, ones we might not want to hear, even though, as another Williams and Penn alumnus, William Carlos Williams suggested, we might die miserably for the lack of hearing such news. Since the publication of that first book, and he has now 11 collections, C.K. Williams has gone on to make an indelible mark on the literary world. In, a, in addition to grants and fellowships from different cultural institutions, he has received the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Literature, the P.E.N. Volker Career Achievement Award given biennially to an American poet whose distinguished and growing body of work represents a notable and accomplished presence in American literature. He has won the Triple Crown of American Literary Prizes, the National Book Critics Circle Award in 1987 for Flesh and Blood, the 2000 Pulitzer Prize for Repair, and the 2003 National Book Award for the Singing. And in 2005, he received the Poetry Foundation's Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize, one of the highest honors given a living US poet whose lifetime accomplishments warrants extraordinary recognition. He is a teacher, a professor of creative writing at Princeton, essayist, translator of Sophocles, Euripides, Francis Ponge, Adam Zagajewski, and of course, he is a poet of social and moral conscience whose work immerses us into the very shape and hue and texture of reality, making us aware even as we endure the br brutalities of war and historical upheavals of what he calls the great gratitude of our lives in which our hearts are wounded with forgiveness. And so I read from the citation, in your teaching and your poetry, you force us to look both within and beyond ourselves. In so doing, you demonstrate the power not only of the word, but of the creative spirit. It is therefore with the greatest appreciation that the University of Pennsylvania presents you C.K. Williams with its Creative Spirit Award. <laughs> So everybody took a paper out of their pocket that was their talk. But when you invite a poet, you have to watch out because the paper he takes out of his pocket might be a poem. And indeed, I'm going to read a poem. I love to strike terror into the hearts of non-poetry people by saying, now I'm going to read a poem. But first, of course, I want to express my gratitude, not so much for the people who are giving me the award tonight, but for what Penn did for me when I was here. It was interesting when you were speaking of the architecture school because through a various series of misunderstandings, I ended up spending most of my time at Penn in the architecture school. 
when someone asked me at one point in my career to speak of what the major influences on my life, my creative life, had been, I realized that Louis Kahn, in fact, had been the model for me for an artist. He was obsessed with his art and obsessed with perfecting it and never giving up a project until it was right. And that's really, in a way, the definition of the beginnings of being an artist. I also had some wonderful literature teachers, Morris Peckham and Maurice Johnson. Maurice Johnson, uh, in my memory, is most important because he wanted to be a poet himself. And he, he was sort of elected by his family to go to graduate school to support the family, who were a, a Nebraska farm family in the Depression. And he went to Princeton and got his PhD. And he was my advisor. And when I went in to see him the first time, he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I want to be a poet. And he said, well, why are you then in school? You should be out writing poetry, which I took as a joke. But then I decided to go to graduate school. And I came to graduate school. And I took a course with him in 18th century novel. Um, um, he was a rhetorical question asker. He would say, um, da -da 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 -da, and what do you think, Mr. So-and-so? Da -da 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 -da, what do you think, Miss So-and-so? And what he did for the two weeks I was in the class, every rhetorical question was directed to me. And what do you think, Mr. He clearly wanted me to leave. <laughs> so I did. But there were times in my life, actually, when I regretted having left graduate school because my life was a little um, uncertain at various times. So there's another element um, that hasn't been mentioned and which for me was very, very important, which was Philadelphia. I learned a terrific amount about um, things about life I hadn't known by by living in Philadelphia. When I was at Penn, I actually moved downtown in my senior year. And then I stayed in Philadelphia for another 20, 20 some years. And Philadelphia at that time, and still was a fascinating, vital city. And it was a city of that was it, um, an instance of America in a way no other cities were quite at the time. For one thing, Philadelphia was the first city to really begin urban renewal on a grand scale. And it was also a city that racially was quite fascinating at the time. There was a lot of mingling of races that didn't happen in many cities. So I'm going to read a poem that takes place that took place actually when I was in college. And I went downtown and was wandering around seeing this strange thing called the city. And there was at 18, on 18th Street between Chestnut and Market, there was a little store. Um, it was a dry cleaner, but then it said invisible mending. And I was quite fascinated by invisible mending by the term. And about 40 years later, it all came, I think 40, maybe even 50 years later, I guess 40, this image of this store, and there were some three women in the store who sat in the window doing their invisible mending. They were much like the three fates of Greek mythology. So I wrote this poem. There's one thing also in the poem that I mentioned that um, we don't usually mention at events like this, which is the fact that an element of university that we tend to forget is loneliness. I think a lot of people at university experience loneliness for the first time in their lives to one degree or another. We're away from our parents. We're away from the community we've known. We're moving into a new community. Sometimes it doesn't work out so well. So this poem dealt, deals with that aspect, too. So the title of the poem is Invisible Mending. Three women old as angels, bent as ancient apple trees, 
who in a storefront window with magnifying glasses, needles fine as hair, and shining scissors, parted woof from warp and pruned what wood and human tissue have been sick. Abrasions, rents, and frays, slits and chars and acid splashes, filaments that gave way of their own accord from the stress of spanning tiny trifling gaps, but which in a wounded psyche make a murderous maze. Their hands as hard as horn, their eyes as keen as steel. The threads they worked with must have seemed as thick as ropes on ships, as cables on a crane. But still their heads would lower, their teeth bare, to nip away the raveled ends. Only sometimes would they lift their eyes to yours to show how much lovelier than these twists of silk and serge the garments of the mind are, yet how much more benign their implements than mine's procedures of forgiveness and repair. And in your loneliness, you'd notice how really very gently they take the fabric to its last. With what solicitude gather up worn edges to be bound. With what severe but kind detachment wield their amputating shears. Forgiveness and repair. Thank you.